Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming this morning. Um, I hand over the floor to Director General Francis Scurry for a few opening remarks, as well as our Chief Economist, Karsten Fink, and then we're happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sama. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you all, and thank you very much for coming this morning. I'm sorry we're starting slightly late. Uh, you have, I think, been given a rather voluminous report, which is, uh, well, it's not so long, but it's quite intense. Uh, let me make just a couple of remarks, and then Carsten Fink, our chief economist, will expand on those, and will be uh, available for questions that you might have. Uh, I would like to point out that this is the first time that we have produced, as it were, an annual report as an organization. Uh, we produce an annual re statistical report, the World Intellectual Property Indicators. This is the first analytical report uh, that we have produced. And uh, so uh, let me record my thanks to the Chief Economist, Carsten Finks, and his team who have worked on this. What have we done it on? We've done it on innovation. Why on innovation? Because innovation is the source, the major source of improvements in productivity, which in turn are the major component of increase in economic growth. It's the source of not only new employment, but better forms of employment. Uh, it is the principal characteristic of competitiveness at the, at the uh, level of the firm, at the level of the industry, at the level of the country. Uh, and it is also the way in which we will, as a society and an economy, address the pressing problems that, uh, for which we require solutions, such as climate change, uh, health, uh, and uh, the necessity to improve agricultural productivity by about 70% by the year 2050 in order to feed a population of 9 billion. So this report looks, uh, first of all, at the changing landscape of uh, innovation, and it notes the historically unprecedented amount of investment that there is in the generation of uh, new knowledge, or uh, more broadly, in intangible assets, first of all. Secondly, uh, it notes that innovation is more multipolar than it used to be or it is multipolar, whereas it used not to be. Uh, and the technological gap between richer and poorer countries is narrowing. And it notes the importance of incremental and local forms of innovation um, uh, as much as world-class pioneering research. Uh, thirdly, in the changing landscape, it notes the increasingly international character of collaboration that takes place in relation to innovation. Uh, and finally, it uh, shows the importance of knowledge markets uh, and the development of knowledge markets, even though it makes the qualification that these are still at an embryonic, relatively speaking, embryonic stage. But if you measure uh, the value of trade, international trade, uh, in intangibles by reference mm -hmm. simply to royalties and licensing, you find that 40 years ago in 1970, the value of that royalties and licensing was $2.8 billion. 20 years later, by 1990, it had become $27 billion. And a further 20 years later, 2009, it had become $180 billion. So this uh, is a significant indication of the importance of knowledge markets, technology markets. The uh, report, of course, from our point of view, looks at the role of intellectual property in all of this and notes that that role has changed because uh, intellectual property first has come, gone from being a special technical specialty to now a matter of economic centrality or centrality to, to the economy. Uh, and secondly, that this central position has provoked, of course, an enormous demand for intellectual property rights. Uh, and we mention in the report, for example, that some there are some 5.17 million unprocessed patent applications around the world. Um, I am going to finish my remarks at that point. I simply want to say that uh, why are we doing all of this? We are doing it uh, in order to 
establish as much as possible the evidence to be able to have informed policy discussions on the appropriateness of our current intellectual property system and the design of the current yeah, intellectual property system for those circumstances which the evidence reveals uh, are present. Um, and to ask whether the current design of the intellectual property system needs modification in any respect to address some of the developments that are outlined in the report. And I have given only a very cursory uh, indication of really chapter one, mainly, of the report. Uh, I'll hand over to Carsten, who will give you a few further details, and then perhaps you have some questions. Thank you very much, Director General. Um, the report itself is divided into two different parts. In the first part, we review global innovation trends, uh, especially those concerning intellectual property, and try to come up with uh, a dispassionate assessment uh, of the extent to which uh, innovation really has changed over the past decade. In the second part of the report, we look at evidence on how IP protection affects innovative behavior, and especially what this evidence implies for the design of IP policy as well as innovation policy more broadly. Let me maybe just highlight a few things that you would find uh, in the report. One uh, first natural step to assess how innovation is changing globally is to look at trends in research and development expenditure. And there we see that global R&D expenditure have almost doubled between 1993 to 2009. It is still the case that 70% of worldwide R&D expenditure is accounted for by high-income countries, but the share of middle-income countries in particular is increasing. It has increased uh, by 13% from 1993 to 2009. Interestingly, about 10 percentage points of those 13% uh, are due to China, and that has propelled China to be the second largest spender uh, on research and development uh, in um, 2009. Now, innovation goes beyond narrow spending on research and development. Uh, we also review evidence that exists on broader investment by firms and in intangible assets. Where those data exist, they uniformly suggest that investments in intangible assets have grown faster than investments in tangible assets. And in fact, there are a number of countries where um, firms invest more in intangible assets than they do in tangible assets. When it comes to intellectual property rights, there's every indication that IP ownership has become more central to the strategies of innovating firms. If one looks at the evolution of uh, demand for patents, one sees that the number of patent applications worldwide has risen from um, uh, about 800,000 uh, applications per year in the early 1990s to 1.8 million applications in 2009. This increase uh, has uh, come in different waves, with Japan accounting for the first wave, followed by the United States uh, and Europe, and most recently the Republic of Korea, and especially China. There are many causes behind this trend. Two key forces are um, that on the one hand, um, there are more inventions that are being presented uh, to patent offices, but also um, inventions are filed in a greater number of countries, and if one quantifies what is uh, responsible for the increase in patenting over the last 15 years, one um, finds that it is both first filings, inventions that are presented for the first time uh, to patent office, as well as subsequent filings, mostly in, in foreign jurisdictions uh, that account uh, for the increase. Uh, the Director General already mentioned the um, increasing importance uh, of uh, knowledge markets uh, that are um, best traced uh, at the international level because international transactions uh, on IP leave their mark in balance of payments. But we also review evidence um, at the domestic level as it uh, emerges from company reports. And the message here is very much uh, that these knowledge markets are on the rise. Um, but they are still relatively nascent. This also brings me to the second part of the report, which focuses on 
um, what we know about um, IP protection and how it affects uh, economic behavior. There are a number of long established insights that probably still apply today, but there are a number of um, things that, uh, uh, that are new where economists have come up uh, with new evidence, with new insights. One of them is that patents increasingly play an important role in helping firms to specialize in the innovation process. If you think of a company that is particularly good at extending the life of batteries, um, it may not be good at developing um, you know, the uh, products that go into the various commercial appliances. However, it can seek out patents and license those patents. And what research has shown is that specialization has occurred in a number of technology fields and really has been facilitated by knowledge-based, um, um, by knowledge markets based on patents. The second uh, new um, um, area of thinking concerns the rise of patenting in so-called complex technologies. Economists define complex technologies as those technologies uh, with uh, many separately patentable elements and where patent ownership is often quite widespread. And that is in contrast to discrete technologies where you often have you know, a limited number of separately patentable inventions and where IP ownership is quite concentrated. One has seen um, rapid growth of patenting in these complex technologies, that to a good extent reflects the nature of technological progress. Complex technologies include many information and communication technologies that we know have seen rapid advances. At the same time, um, studies has, have also shown that there has been um, a shift in companies' use of the patent system uh, that in some industries, the number of patents uh, um, per uh, dollar invested in research and development has increased markedly, and that companies have strategically built up patent portfolio partly to ensure their freedom to operate, to preempt litigation, but also to use their bargain power to cross-license um, technologies that they need for commercializing um, their um, products and technologies. Uh, there are a, a number of concerns that have been expressed, you know, that this might be um, problematic for innovation in a sense that entrepreneurs uh, that face these um, crowded patent landscapes may decide to forego certain innovative activities. The number of answers to um, 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 this concern, private collaborative practices uh, uh, is one such answer, and the report uh, goes in some detail in, for example, discussing the role of patent pools and demonstrates uh, how patent pools have researched over the last uh, uh, 20 years, especially in the IT industry. The report also points to the crucial role that sound patent institutions play in well-functioning innovation systems, Patent institutions perform the essential tasks of ensuring the quality of patents granted and providing balanced dispute resolution. And as the Director General mentioned, um, the unprecedented growth in patenting has put many of these uh, institutions under considerable pressure. Um, there are large backlogs existing in many patent offices, not only in the large offices in the United States at the European patent offices in Japan, but also in many, many middle-income countries, especially if one compares the number of unprocessed patent applications to annual application flows uh, that these middle-income offices uh, receive. Maybe as a final point, um, the report looks at um, collaboration between public research institutions and the commercial sector. Uh, we ask how to best harness public research for innovation. Um, as you probably all know, um, public research organizations and universities play prominent roles in national university, in national innovation systems, especially so in uh, low and middle income countries uh, where often the innovative capacity of the private sector is more limited. Now, what you have seen over the past decade is uh, dedicated policy initiatives to incentivize uh, patenting uh, by these public research institutions and the subsequent commercial development uh, of their inventions facilitated by so-called technology transfer offices. We demonstrate how this um, has prompted an increase in patenting by these type of institutions. For example, under the Patent Corporation Treaty System, we see that 
that um, patenting by universities and public research organization has grown from virtually nowhere in the early 1980s to um, accounting for um, about 10% of all uh, PCT patents in 2010. And that has occurred during uh, the time where the PCT system itself has experienced uh, rapid growth. One also sees uh, significant uh, levels of uh, patenting by universities, especially in China, and patenting um, by public research uh, organizations in India. In India, um, PROs account uh, for about 22% uh, of uh, um, national patent applications. Um, what are the effects of policies uh, that um, incentivize patenting and subsequent commercial development of university inventions? Well, there are multifaceted effects on research institutions and firms, but also more broadly on the science system and the economy. The report uh, points to a number of uh, emerging lessons in that regard. It also points to a number of concerns. Uh, um, that exist, uh, for example, about reduced knowledge sharing among scientists uh, and um, uh, suggests uh, the institution of adequate uh, safeguards uh, so that possible downsides uh, uh, to this effect uh, are limited. Uh, as the Director General mentioned, uh, it is a thick report. Um, um, there are many nuances uh, in the report uh, to what I could say in, in the 10 minutes here. There are additional uh, topics that are covered uh, that I did not mention, so I would encourage all of you to have a look at it. Uh, but I would also be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Isabel Sacco with the Spanish News Agency. Uh, I would like to, um, to, to, to know, um, you mentioned the trend in the, in the increase of research and development expenditure. Uh, you mentioned that it doubled uh, between 93 and 2009. Um, could you uh, uh, concretely say which are the areas of preference where the countries are spending more in research and development. And secondly, I would like to know, um, you mentioned also um, uh, the preference for intangible um, assets um, comparing with tangible ac uh, assets. Uh, could you mention uh, or give us the examples on intangible assets mm -hmm. comparing with tangibles? Um, no, you can go okay. I think on, on your first question, um, we don't in the report have the detailed breakdown of R&D expenditure, uh, partly also because you know, these are not our data, these are data that come from the UNESCO Statistical Institute. You know, they have been extensively discussed in, 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 in their publications, so you know, our value added here is relatively limited. Um, certainly, you know, what has driven growth in R&D expenditure um, differs quite a bit uh, across countries. You know, countries have different areas of uh, specialization. I think if, if there is one common trend, and that is not uh, surprising, certainly there has been a marked increase in R&D expenditures uh, in, in, in the information and communication um, um, technology industries. On your questions on intent, sure, please. If I may just add to what Carsten has said. Look, I don't have the uh, figures on me, um, but if you were, uh, I'm just trying to think of the source. I think you'll find that, uh, that the health sector, life sciences and health sector, account for a very considerable um, portion of R&D expenditure worldwide. I'm, I'm trying to think of the report in which uh, this is, I think you'll find it in Thomson, Thomson uh, Reuters, actually. Um, there is a report that's been done on the pharmaceutical industry in particular, and, you, and you'll see that it is a major spender. It's amongst the biggest uh, spenders in, uh, in all sectors. Sorry, Carlton. Right. Thank you. And, and just quickly, on your second question, what is included under intangible assets? Intangible assets, you know, certainly capture um, investments in intangible assets, capture what is captured by research and development, uh, which are investments uh, mainly geared at uh, 
uh, new technologies and new products, but it's a broader concept. It also includes investments in design, investments in branding, investments uh, in training um, workers and so on. And in fact, uh, what uh, these data show is that often uh, research and development uh, accounts for a mon minority share of investments in overall intangible assets. Uh, I recall, for example, data for the United Kingdom that shows that uh, firms spent more on uh, investments in design than they do on formal research and development. Uh, again, these data um, are only available for a limited number of high-income countries, but I think they are quite revealing um, in, in, in uh, uh, making clear that um, uh, investments in innovation go far beyond narrowly defined uh, R&D expenditure. Usually the focus is on R&D expenditure simply because we have the most data for this variable, um, you know, for the largest number of countries and, and we have it uh, in the form of a long time series. But I think it is important to look at these broader indicators of investment in intangible assets. Thanks. Um, so you're you're um, on the you're talking about um, uh, a boom in um, R and D and mainly in China and Asian nations, but then you talk about a boom in university research patent applications in um, China, Brazil, India, South Africa. I mean, I just want to make sure I'm not um, conflating two different trends. Is is are you, are you basically saying that the I mean you're saying France, Germany, Japan, Britain, and the U S are filing the most patent requests? but that the geography of innovation is shifting, as you say, due to what, the rise in R&D in China and other Asian countries or due to the university research increase in China, Brazil, India, and South Africa? Well, I think the first thing to recognize is that, you know, what we see in patenting trends, you know, is very much reflected in underlying R&D expenditure. You know, the, the, the reason, one of the reasons that patenting by um, Chinese residents has grown so strongly is that there, have been, uh, there has been rapid growth, real growth in R&D investments in China. And, you know, that really has transformed the picture at the global level. Um, you know, in December, we are going to launch our world intellectual property indicators, and there you will see, um, you know, the latest uh, 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 numbers on national patenting, and you, would, you will see that, you know, China's uh, share in global patenting is, is certainly rising. I think that the trend on university patenting is a trend, you know, that originated in, in high-income countries, and still today, um, and we can say this with some confidence under the PCT system, um, um, universities and public research organizations from high-income countries account for most of the patents um, under the PCT, most of the patents by um, universities and public research organizations. Then again, there also is growth um, 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 in patenting by these types of institutions in middle-income countries, and especially in China and uh, in the case of India. In the case of China, more university. In the case of India, it is more the public research organizations. So the two trends are not, are not inconsistent in that way. Pamela Taylor, The Global Journal. Um, I just recently came from the Entrepreneurship Week conference where <coughs> U.S. Ambassador Betty King talked about the important link between <coughs> innovation and entrepreneurship, and you said something similar. And a brief reading of this, and I certainly haven't gone into it in depth because I frankly find your whole organization incredibly intimidating and complex and just gave me enormous understanding as to how you occupy so much real estate in Geneva. But how, what would you say to a young entrepreneur at this, attending this conference here who, who would see that, that you're saying that there's such a backlog in patents and that it's become increasingly complex as far as international filings of patents and uh, what is a young individual entrepreneur, uh, what encouragement could you give him? Uh, look, I would take one step back from, from this, uh, and, and I would say uh, that the, what everyone, where everyone is trying to compete, the space where everyone is trying to compete, is the space of value added. You know? What can you add to raw materials, raw labor and raw 
uh, inputs of physical resources. <clears throat> and you can add various things, uh, but innovation is, of course, the most significant way in which you add value, whether it's organisational innovation or marketing innovation or technological innovation. So it's normal, I think, for a young entrepreneur to be looking for the new ideas in that space and that is the space which is protected by intellectual property. What intellectual property will do for the young entrepreneur is say, if you can add value in that space which distinguishes you from every other actor in the economy, then intellectual property will give you a means of capturing that value and of uh, protecting it and, prote and therefore giving you a, give you a means to build the basis of your enterprise and your entrepreneurship. Now we take that basic idea, which I think has been around for some time, except that everyone now recognises much more clearly you know, this, this space of value added, and we take that and we put it into the context of what's, how's, that, how's that playing out in the world in general. And we see it's playing out in the world in general in a number of ways which have implications. And I've mentioned some, Carsten's mentioned some. You know, there are new actors coming in. There are new ways in which enterprises cooperate. Uh, there are concentrations of patenting in certain areas. Everyone, you know, is aware of the value of, uh, of this space. And so they're, they're looking for rights. So there are a whole lot of, uh, if you like, changes that are occurring in the in the landscape and what we as a public policy institution need to do is to think well is this system of intellectual property that's there to protect your young entrepreneurs uh, novelties and, and 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 new additions is it working well or are there some complications that are impeding its effectiveness. That's the purpose of this report. So I'm sorry, I, does that get to? So basically you're asking the question. You're not proposing well, an answer. Well, I think answer. we're doing slightly more than asking the question. I mean, I think first of all, we're presenting the evidence, you know, and, um, and then on the basis of the evidence, such as it exists, we're asking a number of questions. And uh, some of the questions have partial answers, some of them don't have answers, you know, uh, because policy needs to develop the answers. Well, if I maybe can expand on this, um, uh, in chapter two of the report, we discuss the evidence that uh, exists uh, on the role that patents play in supporting entrepreneurs. And uh, there are a number of uh, firm surveys uh, that have been conducted in the, that regard. And what they universally show is that patents are especially useful for young firms, uh, mainly because they provide signals to financial markets, in a sense that if you're a young entrepreneur and um, you, know, you come up with a bright idea and you need uh, to attract investors uh, to further develop the idea, you know, if you can show that um, um, you, know, you have been granted a patent, that is actually quite helpful because it does provide you, first of all, you know, with an independent certification that um, your invention you know, uh, meets the criteria of novelty, non-obviousness, and industrial uh, applicability. But it also assures investors, in a sense, that you have exclusive rights on the inventions. And I think you know, this has been fairly well established uh, in the literature. But you were the one, I think, who said that, there, that this could be quite discouraging, this complex process. I mean, so that, I guess what my question is, what is your recommendation that a, a young entrepreneur should do? He should go to one of these um, patent, oh no, not the patent corp, what, what was it, the um, pro, public research organization. Is that, is that the procedure for a young person? He, he doesn't go directly to you. Yeah. No, uh, what a young entrepreneur would typically do, you know, is get some advice and the advice would, would say, hey, you know, you need to protect, first of all, your identity in the marketplace, your brand, your trademark, and you go to a patent office and you register, uh, you know, a trademark application and we uh, facilitate that internationally through one of our agreements. So instead of having to file 90 applications in 90 different countries, you file one through us. Okay, then the entrepreneur might have a distinctive design. 
Steve Jobs filed 300 and, or 330, <coughs> you know, uh, patents and designs in the United States of, of America. And that's one of the ways in which, you know, he was able to distinguish his products. So if you have a, a, a design which is, which is special, you know, in the presentation, he transformed the way in which computers looked. First computers and then, well, completely the way they looked. Uh, and so designs is, is uh, another important thing. Or it might be the internal functioning, you know, which is patents. And in, but in each case, you're going along to a patent office. And then instead of going along to 180, you come along to eventually to WIPO, which will uh, facilitate the way in which you can protect this. Uh, Ravi? Uh, no, don't think so. <laughs> if she has finished, uh, I think she still has a question. Do you still have a question, Carol? Uh -huh. It's okay, sorry. Uh, actually, following from her questions and as well as the Director General and Mr. Carlson's answers, I'm st uh, still puzzled by, you know, uh, the happenings and the workings of the real market, which are far more imperfect. I think the assumptions on which you have been f basing yourself, namely novelty and obviousness and how credit will be available, I think in the real market, Imperfect market conditions exist, and in imperfect market, uh, a normal entrepreneur, um, in, you know, a basic amateurish entrepreneur, not a university or a public institute, doesn't have that access to credit, doesn't have the access to uh, IPRs, which are basically based on monopoly conditions. I mean, the fact that IPR is a monopoly right and a kind of royalty for whatever innovation that had come about. Are you actually giving us the real picture that entrepreneur on the street benefits as you put out in this report? Uh, look, go start and then, yeah. I mean, what I would reply is that, you know, certainly I don't want to overplay the role of um, intellectual property. You know, certainly if, um, and, you know, the report also discusses that quite frankly, you know, if you talk about markets, you know, where financial markets, uh, financial systems work imperfectly, um, yes, you know, the, the, the IP system will have its limits in promoting um, innovation. I think what... Uh, the evidence suggests is that the IP system works particularly well, you know, when firms are in a position to um, finance uh, investments either directly or, or through financial markets. Uh, um, uh, it also works uh, better when uh, you talk about um, um, technological problems uh, where uh, solutions are inside. And also when you talk about, um, you know, when there's sort of a match between um, uh, technological needs of societies and the incentives uh, given uh, given by markets. So certainly, you know, the IP system can't solve all the innovation problems uh, that exist in the world. Then again, you know, you do have countries where you do have venture capital uh, markets, where you do have venture capital financing, where you have regular financing through the banking system, where, you know, innovat innovators can have access to finance, and all the evidence suggests, uh, you know, that uh, the patent system uh, does play uh, does make a difference um, so yes I don't want to overplay um, you know the role of, of intellectual property here but you know if you sort of have a dispassionate look at you know what emerges from the evidence it does play a supporting role to ask you on China you yes. know there has been just a piece which I've just read today in economist on state capitalists the rise of state capitalism and particularly this particular state capitalist body which controls about 3.4 trillion assets in companies. Now, are you suggesting that most of the research, I mean, of course, you said repeatedly that it comes from the universities. Can you tell us, throw light on what exactly would be the contribution of state capitalist firms to research and development? We haven't got, I think as Carsten said, <coughs> disaggregated figures on <coughs> the 
source of the R&D funding, but you can explore that. I mean, you can in the literature explore that to a greater extent. It's not in our, we're looking at a global picture and, and the uh, uh, behavior of important components in that. Now, when you go down to analyze within a component such as China, uh, I think you can get quite a lot of information as to where that research and development is coming from. Right, and, and just to clarify, we are not saying that most of the patent applications in China are from universities. Uh, you know, the information that we have is that 14% of patent applications that are filed with the Chinese Patent Office uh, come uh, from uh, universities. Uh, um, you know, and that means that 86% uh, uh, come from um, um, companies, although I think that includes, I think if you also include public research organization, the, sh the company share is, is somewhat lower, but still the great majority of patents in China are accounted for um, by, by companies that may well be uh, state companies, you know, that uh, distinction we don't make in, in patent applications, um, but, uh, you know, still the overwhelming share is, is uh, from the commercial sector. Yeah, um, two questions. One is, um, your agency is 44 years old. Uh, yes and no. But but uh, this is but in, this is in your its first latest incarnation. Uh, you know, it comes from 1970, but its origins. It was a successor organization to uh, an organization that was established in the 1880s. But so, but this is the first annual report. Well, we have done, of course annual reports in in the sense of giving you, you know, the organization did this A, B, C, D, and E, and so on and so on. But an annual report uh, in taking a theme, which is fundamental to the organization, and trying to make a contribution to the analysis of the uh, economic literature, yes, it's the first such. Why, why is that? Because we didn't allow economists through the door <laughs> until <laughs> we established uh, three years ago an office of uh, chief economist, and we are building up expertise in the economic analysis of this area. Um, just to follow up uh, on uh, some other themes, um, on the one hand, there's um, thousands of, of patents that go into the making of and, and the globalization of, uh, yeah. of the, the, the parts that go into making, you know, all these smartphones and lots of other devices. On the other hand, you'd argue that, um, uh, that the patent system is working. Um, w which, which is winning out, do you think, the patent application process or litigation? Well, I don't see the two as, as, as necessarily in competition with each other. I mean, litigation is a normal part of the um, compliance mechanism of any area of policy, whatever it is, whether it's cars on the road or, or patents. You have to have a court system which is there to serve certain functions, uh, and one of those functions is, is uh, providing a definitive resolution of a dispute uh, in this instance in relation to property rights or the possible infringement of property rights. Are people using the patent system in such a way <coughs> that they are focusing not perhaps on manufacturing under a patent, but on using the patent as an instrumentality in a financial market, in a, in a, in a technology, mar technology market, to license or to prevent others from uh, manufacturing. Uh, that is a certain amount of evidence that's put forward in the report concerning this and the behavior of so-called non-practicing entities. And uh, non-practicing entities, are they uh, then uh, able to use a litigation system to their own advantage and to the disadvantage of innovation? Well, there's a certain amount of evidence, although uh, um, you know it's imperfect, uh, in relation to that question. And one of the reasons why we produce the report is to shed some light on that form of behavior and to raise that sort of a question and say, so what sort of a uh, public policy is appropriate in this area? I wanted to ask two questions, Daniel Prusen with BNA. Uh, first of all, on the, the licensing issue, 
Could you uh, elaborate a little bit on that? The, it's a huge increase in uh, the, the dollar figure you're talking about. I'm wondering who, who's paying that and who's receiving that, and are we seeing, as a result of this increase in licensing, a greater concentration of patent rights amongst the big companies who can pay for it? And I was also wondering as well about the backlog of, of uh, patents. You've been complaining about that for years now. I'm wondering if you're seeing any improvement whatsoever or is the situation degrading? Um, and who are those middle-income countries where the, the backlog is worst? Thanks. Um, on your first question about um, royalty flows, um, you know, we present uh, figures uh, on royalty flows uh, based on countries' balance of payments uh, in the report. And I think, you know, the, the good, things, good thing with balance of payments is that, um, you know, this is the one um, place where in some sense these licensing transactions leave a trace and you can actually put a figure to it. And as you mentioned, uh, there has been, you know, a huge increase uh, in these international transactions. Um, we also look at um, national evidence, and that primarily for the United States, uh, where we go into company annual reports and you know see what share of uh, their revenue is based uh, on on licensing income. And you know there is there is obviously great variation. It depends you know very much on uh, the business model of companies. You know you for example have a company like uh, IBM uh, for which um, licensing income has risen to more than 1.1 billion in 2010. You know, for other companies it may be less. I think if you look at, you know, the share of licensing revenue um, in overall revenue in the case of U.S. companies, you know, it is still, still relatively limited, uh, but, you know, it is uh, certainly growing. On your second question, um, who are the middle-income countries? Um, you know, I would refer you to our forthcoming uh, World IP report, uh, you know, which provides you the exact list. Uh, but I can tell you that, or what you see in this report, if you look at the number of unprocessed uh, patent application divided by annual uh, application flows, you would see that you know this sort of relative measure of bad luck is is highest in the case of Chile. It is also high in the case of Vietnam, in the case of Brazil, in the case of Peru. And, you know, this ratio is in fact uh, larger in those middle income country offices than it is uh, for uh, a number uh, of the high income country offices. Quick follow up. You, you don't actually have a breakdown of uh, who's receiving licensing and who, who's paying that out, if I understood you correctly, right? No, you just have yeah, balance yeah. of payment figures and evidence right. from the U.S. market. You wouldn't find it in the report. Um, in most countries, you would not have this breakdown. Um, for a number of countries, you would have this breakdown, especially for the United States and some European countries. Then again, one has to be careful also how to interpret these data, because uh, often they're quite affected uh, by intra-company um, royalty transactions uh, that often you know, serve to transfer uh, money from one jurisdiction uh, to another uh, for tax purposes. So you would, find, for example, find uh, Ireland uh, to feature prominently, uh, prominently in that list. Uh, so these data have to be taken with a, uh, with a grain of salt, but, um, you know, they do exist. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm saying this, but at the same time I do want to point out that uh, the trend that we see at the global level, you know, is perfectly also consistent with what we are seeing at the company level. Then John, then Bob. Or, or the backlog? Yeah. Well, uh, are there signs of improvement? The, the, all, all I could say on that is that in the United States of America, the backlog is coming down. And, uh, and, Japan on their, also. Uh, and Japan also. On their website, they publish a dashboard of indicators, and you can see it's down to about 700,000 now, I think. Uh, so there is signs of some improvement. But, it's, but all the time, you have a growing demand. So it's a, it's a problem to be managed. Hi, uh, Hiro, Mai <coughs> Hiro Maiga from Asashi Bun Geneva, a Japanese newspaper. I'm, uh, I have a question, one question on reference to your reference to the, the patent pools. And the, I'm a little bit puzzled because I'm, I'm, are you suggesting that the WIPO should play a role in maybe uh, creating a patent pool or uh, hiring more experts to sort out this uh, crowded landscape, who, or 
or I trying to suggest some solution, or I just giving you some analysis? Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's 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 we're not suggesting that there should be any role for WIPO. We're noticing that uh, one policy or one instrument, one practical instrument that has been used to deal with the problem of of concentration of pack patents in particular areas or patent thickets, if you like, has been the, the patent pool and that historically uh, patent pools have enjoyed greater or lesser popularity depending on the policy choices taken by regulators in relation to competition law and intellectual property and that therefore this is an area that deserves attention on the part of policy makers. Yes, good afternoon. Nice to see that you've uh, done the numbers that we've been asking for years. We've been waiting for your question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've got a question. Have you also done the number crunching for the estimated income foregone through abuse of patents or licensing arrangements? Why are you worried about them? <laughs> Answer, no, no, the short answer is, is no, and you know I wouldn't even begin to imagine how one calculates that. Um, but uh, the short answer is no, we haven't. There are industry associations that have done estimates that you yourself uh, and your organisation have queried uh, on the methodologies, uh, the way they've crunched the numbers uh, on various areas of IP uh, concerning. Uh, uh, abuse but through, uh, through other instruments like counterfeit products, etc. Right, but I think, you know, this is sort of a different subject area. I think, you know, this report really doesn't go into, you know, the debate on, on counterfeiting uh, and, and piracy. You know, I thought when you mentioned this, it is more, you know, the numbers behind some of the patent litigation that is especially going on. Uh, Samsung here. versus uh, right. uh, Apple. I'm um, sorry. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> uh, how do you, in, in terms of uh, PRO and university um, applications, um, how, how do you separate out uh, PROs from universities in countries like China, Russia, even Mexico, uh, where most of the um, universities are state institutions? Or is there... Or <laughs> Well, if you look at the annex of chapter four, that describes you in detail the methodology that we used uh, to identify universities and public research organizations. Uh, and uh, we literally, um, you know, worked uh, with uh, different lists uh, that, um, you know, uh, we had research assistants helping essentially country by country for the major countries, trying to identify what are the universities and what are the public research organizations, you know. There are uh, without doubt, you know, there are some cases where it's not entirely clear is that a public research organization or a university. Um, you know, in those cases, you know, we had to, um, you know, make some decisions. But I would say that, you know, these cases are a minority. I think in most cases it's fairly clear. You know, certainly, I mean, we are talking about um, millions of patent applications. You know, these are estimates. You know, we are doing our best uh, job here. Um, you know, there are big issues, for example, the way that, you know, certain universities are spelled in patent applications, are you capturing all of them? You know, we spent a lot of time and resources trying to get this right, and I think that the numbers uh, that you would find, you know, make, make sense to us, uh, but, you know, certainly, you know, this is not perfect. And I would say, essentially, a university has students and a teaching vocation, as well as a research vocation, and essentially, a PRO has a research mm -hmm. vocation. Thanks. I um, actually don't know how to ask this question without being personal for a moment. Um, um, my father was a um, physicist turned information scientist who was a, became a pioneer of information science um, and uh, would really enjoy being here grilling you at this moment, but he can't be. Um, He's no longer around, but um, he used to call himself um, a generalist, someone who knows um, nothing about everything versus the specialists who know everything about nothing. Um, I was wondering, because of so much of this is about R&D, 
sp development and spending, particularly in China and the Asian countries. Um, if you can say from this report, uh, if you see any trends related to that in terms of uh, uh, is this boom in, in R&D and university research a function of um, more generalization or more specialization or, uh, you know, can you, can you generalize in that regard as far as what's going on as you talk about the shift in uh, geography? It's, I think it's, we, you know, we're dealing on a very general level, but I would say the most general level is that the technological basis of the economy has become more sophisticated. So if you want to be, whatever you want to just compare the way in which we live now to the way in which people lived in, in the year in 1900, and you'll have an explanation for why there are more patent applications now than in 1900 information technology didn't exist in 1900. You know, nanotechnology didn't exist. L uh, most of the life sciences didn't exist uh, in the way in which they exist now. So the accumula steady accumulation of the knowledge base basis, look at the ta amount of time that it takes for one generation to pass its knowledge on to the next generation, other otherwise termed education, you know. People are, uh, go through education these days, and increasingly master's degrees are required of young graduates. Uh, so increasingly the time of passage from, of, of knowledge from one, existing knowledge from one generation to the next is, is expanding out to 25 years or 26 years or whatever it may be compared to how it was. So that general accumulation of the knowledge base and technology base of the economy, I think, is an explanation for why, as a general matter, why we are getting more and more investment in it. Because you have to advance on a, on a much broader basis. I, I mean, I, that's what I would say as a, as, as a generalization. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, can I come back to following this question? Namely, what would be the magnitude of patents in the so-called IT-related financialization, which have now greatly contributed to the collapse of the financial industry. Has this problem been addressed, namely the innovation that had taken place in the IT al algorithms and which have been largely responsible for financialization of the world economy yeah and how they have brought it down thanks to this innovation well let's just assume that what you say is correct i think the yeah let's just assume that what you say is correct that 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 uh, financial innovation if you like uh, was in some way responsible for for the financial crisis the pertinent question for us, because we're not the IMF or, or the World Bank or, or um, the, yeah, the pertinent question for us is to what extent that financial innovation was the subject of intellectual property protection, right. uh, and then to what extent the incentive provided by intellectual property protection influenced behaviour to cause that. Uh, uh, those innovations to come about, uh, which they, because they may have come about even if there'd been no intellectual property protection. I mean, so I think we're in a territory in which we haven't done any research in this area, but. Right, I, I think, you know, I haven't seen any study, you know, that, you know, s sort of even tried to establish, you know, causality between some of the financial innovation, you know, that you have seen in the lead up to the crisis and whether that has connected to patenting. But I would argue that from a pure policy point of view, you know, I think it is a matter of financial regulators, you know, to make sure that any new financial innovation that is introduced, you know, is compatible with um, um, financial stability. And I think, you know, this is a question that, you know, in principle, the patent system, you know, is, 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 is you know, agnostic is not responsible for and I think you could take this to other fields you know the patent system you know does provide incentives for the development of pharmaceutical products but obviously it's the job of you know uh, regulators to make sure that only those pharmaceutical products are brought onto the market you know that uh, are beneficial to society 
I think we'll take John, and then I think we've all earned the lunch here. So. Yes, I, I'd like to follow through on Ravi's question and Carsten's response uh, on the uh, regulator ensuring that a new uh, product that uh, is patented uh, complies with financial stability in a globalized financial system where you're trading in three or four time zones, how do you guarantee that? It's not possible. Yeah. Secondly, some of the products introduced can summarize a trading in the market in two minutes, and if you don't have that product, you're on a handicap. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, a patent doesn't authorize you to do anything. Uh, what a patent does is it, also, it, it, it enables you to stop other people from doing something. That, that's the essential nature of a patent. So it gives you an exclusive right. Uh, but it doesn't give you any right to do anything. You can get a patent, arguably you could get a patent in certain areas, although there is, is a ground of patentability which relates to public policy. Uh, but arguably you can get a patent that doesn't in, enable you to use a pesticide or a pharmaceutical, as, as, uh, as Carsten has mentioned, or anything else, unless you get the appropriate regulatory authority for your product or service. Sorry, I've been a bit biased to this side of the room. If we can go to this side and take maybe two, two questions. Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel, here today with IP Watch. Um, just a question regarding the word innovation and um, maybe WIPO's role as a um, policy-making institution in terms of innovation. There's been a number of um, initiatives that WIPO's supporting uh, regarding innovation, and I suppose this report could have been on uh, many other topics. So I guess what is um, WIPO's role to support or advance innovation? Is this a um, major priority? Well, we uh, have a role to promote the protection of uh, intellectual property in the formal terms in which it is uh, expressed in our, our enabling convention. But why do you uh, have, why does intellectual property exist? And the reason why it exists essentially is innovation. I mean, it's also cultural creativity in the, in the copyright area, but that is the reason, that's the underlying social objective that's being pursued by an intellectual property system. And so it's, I think, a perfectly legitimate question to ask whether the intellectual property instrument is actually serving that purpose, or what's happening in that space which can influence the, the nature of intellectual property policies. Right, I maybe should also say, you know, this is our first world intellectual property um, report. Um, we dearly hope this is not the last one. You know, this is intended to be uh, serious. And, you know, we picked the, the theme of uh, the changing face uh, of innovation as the theme for the first report. Um, you know, we had to start uh, somewhere. Probably also, you know, we were pragmatic in a sense, you know, that in this field we know we have quite a bit of data to draw on. You know, there are a number um, of um, uh, studies to draw from uh, that we could use for the purposes of this report. But, you know, as the forward by the Director General says, you know, we hope to address other IP themes in the future, including, you know, the role of uh, copyright and the creative industries, uh, including trademarks and branding. Um, so stay tuned. Name is Hans Maurus from German National Public Radio, ARD. Uh, I wonder if you have come across in the last 12 months or so um, by, uh, uh, well, with an a invention by an individual, by an inventor, that you thought was really brilliant or exotic or strange or just unique or just great that you were, was breathtaking. And the second question, uh, how serious is intellectual property theft through the internet in innovative ways, through like Trojans and worms. Uh, how, how do you, do you watch this development at all? Do you think it is a serious threat to contribute to erosion of intellectual property rights? Thank you. I mean, the first question is a very interesting one because uh, how, do, uh, you, how do you assess the impact of particular inventions? Uh, and the reality is that what the patent system does is, is says, you know, of all of the information that's out there, this class of information we are going to reward with a property title. And this class is, it's got to be new, uh, you know, it's got to not be obvious, 
and it's got to be capable of an application. And they're fairly, you might say, fundamental requirements, but they're not bad requirements. And then when you get through that, uh, then I think the only uh, evaluator that we have out there for determining whether something is, is going to have an impact is the market. Uh, and it's the market that, that is going to take up certain areas uh, or not take up certain areas and whether or not the market does usually determines whether it's going to have an impact on our lives. Of course, it can be the case that that reaction can be very delayed. In the case of television, for example, it was revealed, or the jet, or jet engine, they were both revealed in patent applications well before they were commercialised. They were commercialised decades later, actually. So uh, there can be a delayed reaction. That's the imperfection of the market mechanism, I suppose. Uh, so we can't really say, we're not in a position to say, oh, this one is going to have a big impact and that one uh, is not. Um, although there are people that watch that, and for example, when the uh, first iPhone came out, it was actually published as a patent application about two months before the iPhone hit the market, and there was a certain amount of speculation out there, what's Apple going to do? Here, uh, it's going to publish a new phone, a new variety of phone, and here's what the patent application says. So uh, it can give you some informa information and some people can uh, evaluate that information. Now, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the second part of the question, which was... Um, which oh, yes, was yes, the, the well, look, as you no doubt know, there's been a report published recently on this um, in the United States of America, uh, which attempts to quantify uh, or say something about the extent to which there uh, is uh, the illicit collection of information through uh, the internet and through uh, computer networks and it is what it is but we don't have any position on that. Um, we don't have, a, it's not an area that we are, uh, have any active program in. Yeah. Why not? Well we have a regulatory framework which deals with it. The Paris Convention has uh, a, a requirement that countries adopt an unfair competition uh, law and a, a normal feature of an unfair competition law is that you cannot steal the trade secrets or confidential information of a competitor. So that is part of the regulatory framework that is required of any member state of the, uh, or any contracting party to the Paris Convention as well as, of course, to the TRIPS agreement in respect of undisclosed information. <coughs> but uh, these are the establishment of the regulatory framework and norms. A different question is the one I think that you asked, which is, are we monitoring this? And to have any role in monitoring uh, the compliance with uh, legislative norms is a major step for an international organisation. Um, and, and you will notice that, in general, the international community has, over the last 60 years, been very fertile at developing norms, new norms, but has rather greater difficulty in developing agreement on compliance mechanisms for those, whatever the field, whether human rights or, or intellectual property. Uh, so the, I think the answer to that is we have a program on respect for intellectual property, building respect for intellectual property, but there's no consensus amongst the member states as to the extent to which we should go in that direction. Sorry, I, I, coming back to the, your report again, a bit of a theoretical dilemma, namely, uh, you know, patenting for the real economy versus patenting for casino economy. Casino economy here, I mean the financial industry. The casino. So it, in a battle between one versus 99, so whom does WIPO, I mean, this is just a kind of puzzle, a dilemma. Uh, whom does, whom do you serve? I mean, you know, where patents are largely for casino economy, is it good for your organization to sort of, you know? Well, look, um, I don't know where you, uh, uh, how you arrive at the conclusion that we are patents for the casino economy, you know? Um, that's, 
uh, I think, something that needs to be actually established. Uh, and I would point to all of the positive advances that there are. I mean, the, the, the way the system works is that the intellectual property system, notably the patent system, is there amongst other things because this report shows a number of changing perceptions. Uh, but amongst other things, it's there to incentivize or to encourage investment in the development of new knowledge. Okay? Then, once that new knowledge is put out there and commercialized in one way or another, there are a whole range of market mechanisms which will determine whether those, uh, those, that new knowledge is taken up and used by society. Uh, and, and not just market mechanisms. I mean, there are other uh, in evaluators that are out there for, for saying whether some new knowledge is socially use useful or not. Uh, and um, so I, do, I don't see where it is that, uh, you know, what your question is uh, directed at. Between Warden versus 99, where 99 being the 99 percent of the people who are failing to get the benefits of the innovation, and the one person who is sort of hogging off these benefits, and this one person benefiting out of the so-called financial innovation and the you know related uh, sort of spin-offs that are taking place, uh, is it time to have a look into patents in terms of? Yeah. Well, look, I, again, I don't know where you get the 99% and the 1%, uh, but uh, I would say that that the, the essence of the intellectual property system is to establish a balance. And it's a balance between, on the one hand, the creation of new knowledge, and on the other hand, the diffusion of the social benefit of that new knowledge. And that is a complex operation, establishing that balance. If you go too far uh, in respect of, of encouraging the creation of new knowledge, you might have, you might have developed a lot of new knowledge, but the social benefit is not necessarily shared. And if you go too far on the side of the diffusion of the new knowledge, you might be able to share a lot more of less, because there's less that's created. So the balancing mechanism, it's a complex mechanism. That's what the whole subject, I think, of intellectual property is about. And if you take the health field, that's it's where it's at its most dramatic, of course, because mm -hmm. Enormous investment is required in order to enable us to be more innovative than the microbes. And if we're not, we're in trouble, you know, especially in a densely populated world. And that requires enormous investment. But on the other hand, if you don't actually, if, if what is produced by that investment is not shared and not uh, used by a substantial population, then there's relatively little benefit from the investment. So the balance is, is, I think, what what it's all about, and what, and here this report talks about, you know, different areas where the balance is affected uh, by concentration of patenting, what some sort of mechanisms can be used in this way or that way, who is investing, you know, who is in uh, that the changing players, how they're doing it, how that. Uh, so I think that's what we're talking about. Last question, Bob. Um, looking at the report, um, the one area of the, uh, of the world which seems to um, play absolutely no role whatsoever, um, apart from Africa, is, uh, is, is uh, Arab Middle East and, uh, and Iran. Is there any um, indication that there, there is an in, um, a growing effort in those countries to um, uh, to invest in, in R&D, and particularly um, um, in, in terms of producing um, uh, or filing patent uh, applications? Yes, there is. Um, it's, it's more anecdotal. I can't give you, and uh, uh, maybe Carsten can, but I can't give you a, a scientific answer to that question. But if you take a, a, a country like Qatar, enormous investment has been made in, in the establishment of a science park. Uh, and the ancillary uh, institutions that are required to take the developments produced in the science park through to the market stage. That's one example. 
but I think there is a, a consciousness uh, uh, in many of the Arab countries of, of the need to address this, this area, and we see that in, uh, in our capacity building programs. Thank you very much.